Um, hi, I'm Adam uh, I'm a principal software engineer in Zen Server Group at Citrix. Um, I've been in Zen Server since 2009. Uh, and my main area of responsibility are the Windows PV drivers uh, and lately virtual GPU as well. Uh, but this is about Windows PV drivers. So today's talk is basically kind of a history uh, and a tour of what we've done. So um, I want to start with the drivers in the state that they were, that they were in in uh, Zen Server 6.0.2, uh, what we did in 6.1 and why, and where we want to go in future. And that includes making the drivers available to a wider audience, uh, making them work on installations other than Zen Server. Um, so I want to give a bit of insight into the, the general driver structure um, and also then move on to how one might write another PV driver, where it would fit in the stack, uh, the kernel interfaces we expose to make life easier for doing that. And then I'll finally sort of wrap up with um, how to take one of our current uh, drivers, which is now open source, build it uh, and install it yourself. So. So why should you use PV drivers? Uh, well, HVM guests get emulated hardware, as we've been hearing. Um, on Zen server today, that means basically you get up to three IDE disks because we need the fourth IDE slot for the CD-ROM. Uh, I believe we can do up to eight Realtek um, network drivers, uh, network devices. So they're uh, 100 megabit devices, pretty ancient. We use Realtek because that's the only inbox network driver Windows XP has, and we still have to support Windows XP. Um, but emulation is done by essentially trapping I.O. port accesses uh, or uh, MMIO page faults. It's very slow. Not so bad if your hardware is DMA driven, but pretty much those, go those devices aren't. So um, it's, it's pretty slow. Um, Migration is also problematic. I mean, theoretically, it should work. Uh, but in testing we've done in, in Zen Server, it's pretty flaky. Uh, falls over quite a lot of time. Uh, and we don't have source code for the, um, for the device drivers on Windows, so we can't really debug it very easily either. Um, so PV avoids these limitations um, by massively reducing the number of VM exits, um, by not using I.O. emulation and page faulting for MMIO, um, removes the limits on the number of disks and nets, or removes those limits on the number of disks and nets and increases them massively. Uh, and we have the, the code for the suspend migration path, so we can debug it. Um, and the VM can suspend and migrate cooperatively, which makes it less prone to failure. So I'd like to uh, just go through a bit of, of notation, first of all, I'm using in the slides. Um, Windows drivers basically um, hang off of physical device objects which are enumerated by bus drivers. So there is a, a top-level bus driver in Windows which goes and enumerates its bus, and then everything cascades uh, tree-like from that point downwards. Uh, so when Windows notices you've got a new physical device object, that's when you see the, the, the pop-up saying, found new hardware, it'll wander off, try and find a device driver for it. Uh, device drivers in Windows, uh, the packages carry something called an inf file, which basically specifies what, that, what type of device uh, that device driver will bind to. So Windows uses those to go and discover new drivers for hardware as, as it appears, and it will go and install drivers onto those devices. Um, Function dri uh, the driver that binds to a physical device object is called a function driver. It creates a function device object. Function, uh, function drivers can also be bus drivers, so that's how it cascades and they can enumerate new PV, uh, PDOs. Um, I've used a little bit of notation there to denote the Zen store keys that I'm using to create PDOs in, in, in PV space. Um, and then the dotted lines that surround are the packages uh, that ship the actual drivers, because you're allowed to ship multiple drivers in a single package in Windows. Uh, and then off to the side there, that purple one, uh, there's a, another type of device driver you can write in Windows called a filter device driver. Uh, and that can sort of sit above physical device objects or function device objects uh, and intercept some of the IOs that they do and thereby change their behavior. So this is the, the driver structure we had in 6.02. Um, so it's a pretty odd driver structure. You can see it sort of hangs off of two parents rather than just one. Um, one of them's uh, called a root enumerated node, the one on the left, uh, that's created by an installer. Um, the one on the right is synthesized by Kimi, that's a PCI device. Um, the storage driver directly hung off the PCI device. Uh, the main reason for that, I believe, was that uh, 
it was thought necessary to do that to allow crash dump to occur properly because if you're writing uh, storage device drivers in Windows, there's really no documentation to do it. You're just, you're just expected to write a storage driver for a, PV, uh, for a PCI device and then it all magically works. Um, this doesn't quite ring true, but um, I don't think anybody really wanted to take on the job of trying to write a non-PCI storage driver and then try and figure out what didn't work and why. Um, so Zen Dimensions and Util are the main interfaces to Zen, but as you can see, they're kind of split across two packages. Zen Util has to be shipped with NVBD so that we can do the crash dump support, uh, but Zen Dimension basically enumerates everything else um, and talks, and, and the, the interface to Zen is split between those two in a very odd way, and it's uh, quite hard to manage. Zenbif, there is a class driver for network. Um, it was easier to do a class driver for network because supporting operating systems from XP through to Windows 7 meant we had to deal with two different Endis protocols or Endis mini port wrappers. Uh, so actually it made a lot more sense to put the network code into one driver, which you could then ship on all versions of the OS, uh, and then leave the Endis 5, Endis 6 drivers at the bottom uh, to be very small little thin wrappers on top of that. So that's why we did it that way. Um, you'll also notice there's a driver there called SCSI filter, which is in this, um, that sits below each of the disks, uh, the disk drivers. The disk drivers are shipped by Windows, they're just part of the standard the OS. Uh, but the problem is that we were using a storage model called SCSI port, uh, again for compatibility back to Windows XP. SCSI port basically has a single queue per HPA uh, and all, calls all your entry points at interrupt level. Um, so it's extremely hard to use. You can't allocate memory, for instance, basically in your driver. You have to get the framework to do everything for you. It does it in a pretty horrible way uh, and most things end up being single threaded. Uh, so by sticking the filter driver on there, we could avoid the, most of the I.O. even entering the SCSI port wrapper, we sort of cherry-picked it out before it got there and shipped it over the PB ring first. Uh, so that way we could actually write a sensible net, uh, storage driver and do everything at a, a much lower interrupt level. So actually, I've probably said all this already. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll move on to the, uh, the next slide. So actually, you know, go back to the bottom of that one. Um, no, she's, there's, a, there's a problem with the, with the, the, the structure we had before. Um, the use of the root node, um, the installer created root node meant we actually needed an installer to install these things. And the cross package dependency meant we had to upgrade everything as a unit. Um, one of the desires is that we eventually move our drivers onto Windows Update because at the moment you've got to, if, if you want to upgrade your drivers and you want to install your drivers, you've got to run the install on every single VM on your host, and if you've got several hundred VMs, that's a pain. Um, by putting stuff on Windows Update, uh, the hope in the future is that you just install Windows on your VM, and then it just goes and grabs the drivers all by itself. You don't have to do anything particularly active. Uh, you just sit around and wait, and it will just deal with it itself eventually. Um, we haven't done this yet, but that's where we want to go. So around that time, enter Windows 8. Um, so Microsoft had this big get together at the Anaheim Convention Center in LA um, and came up with sort of a small bombshell uh, which was they decided that they'd ship a new WDK or Windows Development Kit for Windows 8 that first of all you had to use Visual Studio to build your drivers now uh, worst you actually have to use a paid version of Visual Studio there's nothing we can do about that one so you had to throw away your old build script um, the other thing was that they only, uh, the new WDK, you could only build drivers back to Vista. Um, so 2K3 and XP still in support, you couldn't build drivers for them anymore. So now you couldn't have a single binary which would support an OS all the way from XP through to Windows 8. Because they also told us that you had to build your drivers with Windows 8 WDK if you wanted to logo them for Windows 8. Which we want to do because for support contracts people need to, to run logo drivers. So we had to do something. So we decided to come up with a new set of drivers. So for Zen Server 6.1, uh, since we have to come up with a new set of drivers, we might as well choose some reasonable goals. So with Windows Update in mind, we wanted to get rid of the need for the installer. We were still going to have an installer because it's a friendly way to ship drivers. We're not on Windows Update yet, so we still have to have a mechanism for people to install. Um, we wanted to get rid of the cross-package dependencies because the whole upgrade as a unit thing makes things fragile. So if we could have 
versioned interfaces between the drivers discovered at runtime, then they could be independently upgradable. Um, and that would be necessary for Windows Update because we couldn't enforce people to upgrade drivers in a unit. Uh, we couldn't even enforce the order in which they would upgrade drivers. Um, and also, at that, because we were doing this split anyway, uh, we decided these new drivers are only buying back to Vista. Uh, and if we were doing that, then we could get rid of the SCSI port model. We could use a newer store port model, which basically removed all those, all those problems that SCSI port had. It was a queue per disk now. Was, didn't enter your driver at interrupt level, entered at dispatch so you could allocate memory. So we didn't need SCSI fill anymore. So this is the new structure. Um, a lot simpler, single parent. Um, Zen and Zenbus replace what was Zen Util and Zen Invention, uh, more sensible <laughs> names. Zen is basically the whole of the interface to Zen. So it, it's an export driver, it's essentially a library uh, which, the other dri which the Zenbus driver uses. So it's the thing that sets up the hypercall page and actually marshals all the calls through to, through to Zen. Uh, Zenbus is there basically to, to talk to Zen Store and enumerate children and provide more abstract interfaces, which we'll go into later. Uh, ZenBBD is now store port, so no SCSI fill, much simpler. Um, however, you'll notice the addition of one filter driver in there, which is ZenFill. Um, ZenFill is there to actually <coughs> to pose on the root PCI driver. And the reason is that we still need to get in there before the root PCI driver enumerates emulated devices, because we've still got to do the magic uh, IO port unplugs to key you to stop the emulated networks and such things appearing uh, in w when we're using PV drivers. It's also around this time, well actually shortly after we came up with this driver structure, um, I guess it was just before Zen Server 6.2 or maybe just after, I can't remember, we also uh, decided to open source the drivers. Um, so pretty much this was done by just taking the source we had, chucking it up on GitHub, um, split up into the five driver packages, each one in their own repo, sticking a BSD2 clause license on them, uh, and there you go. Um, we chose BSD2 clause uh, because we couldn't logo them if they were GPL. Uh, Microsoft's test agreement prevents you from using GPL. Uh, we went back to them with different variations of GPL v3 and LGPL, but nothing was good enough, so, so BSD was, uh, was what we stuck with. A um, couple of problems, though, with these drivers as they stood. Um, we had a patch keying you in, um, in Zen Server. Actually, you'll notice from the previous slide, if you're eagle-eyed, that we changed the device ID on that PCI device from what it was before. Um, there was a good reason for doing that, which is that if we ever went onto Windows Update with, update with drivers that bound to the old platform PCI device, then everybody in existence running Zen with a Windows VM would suddenly start getting Windows Update drivers, which we thought was probably an unfriendly thing to do. So we changed that. Problem is that only Zen Server creates that device. So even if you wanted to use the drivers, uh, you'd still have to patch your own key you if you weren't using Zen Server. Uh, other thing was that all the build scripts assumed you were uh, working for Citrix and had Citrix's code signing certificate. So you couldn't actually build any way without hacking the script. So we have to do something about this. So this is why we came up with the idea of the upstream drivers. Um, largely, this is the 6.2 PV drivers with these problems removed. Um, so we went back to the emulated device unplug uh, mechanism. Oh, sorry, I should have mentioned we also use a, uh, another emulated device unplug mechanism in Zen Server 6.2, um, which was never upstream. So with the upstream drivers, we also use the existing emulated device unplug mechanism that's available in QEMU and has been forever. Um, so you can use pretty much any version of QEMU you want to. Um, the platform device ID, we made the drivers um, bind to the old platform device ID, I'll go into that in a moment, uh, but I also upstreamed a patch into QEMU to create a new PV device uh, for the purpose of just doing Windows Update in the future. So that way we didn't have to modify the existing platform device, you could just add a new device to your system if you wanted to get drivers from Windows Update. Um, the goal was to make it work on pretty much anything, um, so I've tested it on Zen back to 3.4, uh, up to 4.4, uh, I've tested with 32-bit, 64-bit Debian DOM zeros. Um, only one thing I ran into was a problem with NetBack uh, relying on UDEV um, because of the way that Windows needs all its devices to start in a closed state. 
Um, the tool stack creates the devices in a sort of initialized state, so it actually has to then close them and then restart them. And that cycle <coughs> through closed uh, was relying on UDEV kicking um, or basically reinserting the, uh, the BIF back onto the bridge. So if you weren't running UDEV, it didn't work. Everything just stalled. So I, I, um, I've just put a patch into Linux uh, a few weeks back to solve that problem. So you will need, I think, a three dots. Well, I, I've submitted stable patches back to 3.10. Uh, I don't know whether they're there yet. Um, but certainly if you use a 3.12 Linux, you'll be fine. Um, and all the code as it stands at the moment is on some upstream branches in each of those GitHub repos that I mentioned before. Uh, we will be folding into the master branches fairly shortly. Uh, we're most of the way through our QA tests now, but there's still some internal Zen server QA that's failing. Uh, so we can't actually use them for mainstream at the moment, but that should probably be fixed in about a week or so, I reckon. Um, so yeah, I mentioned the Zen bus binding. So to, to make things usable by most people, uh, the Zen bus driver needs to bind to the existing platform device that everybody has. Um, this was something that Amazon requested of us as well, uh, because they use our PB drivers. Um, so that's what we did. Um, thing is, though, we can't have, as I said before, people suddenly starting to get device uh, drivers and Windows update when that occurs. So we make it bind to that drive device and we make it bind to the new one that I upstream into, into QEMU. Uh, but it echoes through the device information from that device when it's creating its children. Uh, and we will only ship drivers onto Windows Update with the bindings for the new device ID. So that way, if you bind to the old one, you can use the driver, but you won't get drivers from Windows Update. But yeah, if, you, if you have the new device, then you will get drivers from Windows Update, but it's still the same binary. So I mentioned also the runtime discoverable interfaces. Um, in Windows, when you've got drivers in a parent-child relationship, it's actually quite easy to do. Um, there's a, a message you can send called a payment query interface, uh, where you can just say, I want an interface with this global UID. Um, and then if the, uh, the thing wants to reply in, in the affirmative to you, it can just pass you a jump table, basically. Um, and if it doesn't know about that interface, then the, the, the idea is you cascade that request upwards. So eventually, something in the, in the tree of device drivers, if it implements it, will come back to you with a positive response. If there's nothing there, then you just, it goes all the way up to the top, and then the, the plug and play manager responds with a, with a nothing knows about that interface. Um, so that way you can have interfaces implemented at different levels, and the client of that interface doesn't actually have to care. Uh, this is quite important because we have a couple of interfaces exported by the Zenfilt driver so that a, a PV driver at the bottom of the stack can figure out whether the emulated device that it's aliasing exists and then say, right, I'm not going to start if the emulated device is there. Because one of the problems we ran into in the past is that if the emulated unplug doesn't work, you can end up in a situation where you have PV storage and emulated storage for the same disk at the same time. Uh, that generally corrupts your file system fairly quickly, uh, and from that point onwards, your, your VM is dead. So the general sequence is you query uh, by GUID and version. There's a whole set of interface uh, header files. If you go look in, say, the Zenbus repo is a good place to look. Uh, there's an include subdirectory in there where you'll find all these sort of things. Um, I've said, yeah, examples for querying there, uh, that particular uh, Zenvif repo is a good place to look for a query. Zenbus implements the vast majority of the interface, and then Z so Zen yeah, Zenbus implements the vast majority of the interfaces. Zenvif is a client of those interfaces. It needs quite a few of them, so it's a good place to go look for how that interface structure works and how the jump table gets passed back. Um, I wrapped the use of the interfaces in sort of convenience macros. Um, so the general sequence is you use the convenience macro that's specified in the header you're interested in. So if it was like the you know, Zen store, the, the convenience macro is called store. Um, then you acquire and release around when you're, you want to use the interface. That's just so we can maintain a reference count. This makes life much easier if you're uh, doing power management transitions. Um, certainly when I was debugging things like S3 and S4 power states, it made life a lot easier having that reference count day so you could see if something was hanging around that shouldn't be hanging around. Uh, and that's just a list of a way you would find certain interfaces. I said Zenbus implements the vast majority. There's kind of usual suspects there. You've got a, a grand table interface, an event shell interface, store. Uh, the debug interface, um, Zenbus hooks the debug virk. So when you hit the Q debug key in Zen, you get that interrupt injected into the guest. Uh, 
So any other driver can go and use the debug interface to register a callback. So it can just dump state out to the log at that point. Um, Zenfilt uh, implements device unplugging, as I said, and the emulated interface to determine whether, so another driver can figure out whether an emulated device is present or not. Uh, and then Zenvif implements the, the VIF interface uh, for the network drivers. So that does all the uh, VIF netback uh, driver state, um, or ring state management, uh, connection and you know, packet reception, etc. So how to build a driver? Um, well, as I said before, you need Visual Studio. Uh, unfortunately, you can't use the Express free edition. Uh, you can use the 30-day trial edition um, if you don't have an MSDN subscription. Um, you need the Windows 8 WDK. Uh, if you go onto the standard Microsoft sites now, because 8.1's out, the WDK you will find by default is the 8.1 WDK, uh, but we don't use that yet. You'll still need the 8.1, however it is available at that URL. Um, the wrapper scripts around the um, MS build environment that Windows 20, uh, that Visual Studio uses uh, are in Python now instead of shell, which meant you needed SIGWIN before. Um, so you need a copy of Python 3.x. Um, you have to set three environment variables that I listed there just to basically tell it where the kit is, where Visual Studio is, and where you want to put your symbols when the driver's built. Uh, and then off you go. Uh, you can build free or checked. Checked is just the debug. That's just the Microsoft terminology for debug build. Um, and then also in each of the repos, you'll find an install.md, which is separate from the readme.md, because you may actually want to ship it out to people if you were sending packages. Um, but installing a driver is, is pretty trivial. Um, the build just creates a directory and a tarball of that directory if you want to use that instead. Uh, you just need to get that onto your VM. Um, and then in there, you can either point uh, device manager at the inf file. It's in there using the have disk option uh, from device manager. Or there's actually a little convenience install that Microsoft provides as a redistributable executable, uh, which we just stick in those directories. So you can just run that, uh, and it will uh, install the driver for you. Uh, because we don't expect everybody to have Citrix's code signing certificate, uh, we also test sign the drivers now. Uh, that has small repercussions. Uh, if you want to avoid big scary warnings when you install the drivers, you need to install the test certificate on your VM. Uh, there is actually a separate test certificate for each of the drivers. Uh, it's in a PFX file, which is not password protected, uh, so you can just stick it on the, on the VM very easily. It's in the project subdirectory of each of the repos. Um, but one caveat is you must make sure you set test signing mode on for 64-bit VMs because as soon as you install ZenVBD, uh, it's managing your system disk and if test signing is not on, it won't load uh, and thereby you will fail to boot. So if you go look in the maintainers in each of the repositories, there's my name in there and also the names of my team. Um, any of us are happy to take contributions. Uh, we will take discussions on XSDevel, um, so feel free to, to ask us questions. Uh, we're happy to help. Um, we're hoping in future, as I kind of alluded to briefly in one of my comments earlier, we're, we are looking at doing PVHID ourselves. It's one of the future projects. We already have drivers for PVHID. It's just that we need some small modifications to the HID protocol, because I believe at the moment it scales with the size of the VNC console, so you kind of get strange problems uh, when you try and use it. We'd also like to possibly explore uh, pushing multiple touch points through that protocol if possible. Um, and I think the coordinates in that protocol are relative at the moment and it would be nice if they're absolute. Um, other things we'll be interested in will be PVUSB. Because um, occasionally we do get uh, queries from people wanting to pass through USB keys into VMs. We don't really have a good story for that at the moment. Um, and I think obviously if we could turn off emulated USB, as we mentioned before, uh, it would be a, a good performance win. So yeah, any, uh, any further questions? Do we have a mic? I assume this means that you removed all Microsoft example code from the drivers so that yep. you were able to... So yeah, that was, that was one of the things that held us up. We have um, one of the drivers I didn't put in my diagrams there, uh, just for simplicity, is we have a driver called uh, Xenoface. Um, literally all that does is implement uh, a WMI provider, which allows you to talk to Zenstore. Uh, 
um, because in Zen Server our guest agent is written in .NET um, and it just makes life an awful lot easier if you've just got the WMI version of Zen Store there. Um, that driver was heavily, heavily ripped off from the toaster sample driver uh, shipped with the WMI. Aren't they all? <laughs> yeah, exactly, as a lot are. So uh, we did a bit of a clean room rewrite of, uh, of most of that code, uh, apart from the WMI code, which was already ours. And, um, is there a reason why you're using XS Devel instead of Zen Devel where everybody else is? Um, only that it's essentially already the discussion for uh, forum for Zen Server related features and these drivers are still branded the Zen Server PV drivers. Uh, I'm happy to take discussion on Zen Devel as well. I do squat on Zen Devel so uh, if people want to ask questions there too but you probably like to get a better and quicker response if you go on to XS Devel. I would be very keen We'd be very keen for uh, these drivers to be part of the Zen project um, if the Linux Foundation would be happy to have Windows drivers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I had that discussion with them, um, and that probably is okay. Um, so, if you wanted to do that, probably the best way is to, you know, Start a discussion on Sandy Well, and I can just. I mean, the, you know. the, the only thing I was concerned about was, was just the branding. Um, it's pretty trivial branding. I mean, it's just you have to have a name for these things in, in the in files, and we just use the Zen server name for now. But you know, we could just call them Zen if if that wasn't going to piss off too many other people, yeah. like James Harper or somebody, for instance, who obviously has his own set of GPL PV drivers. Well, my point was that. Since we haven't gotten around in Zen Client to writing the mm -hmm. Linux uh, PV USB front end, it, it might actually be valuable if we're able to. I mean, I don't even know about talking yeah. with management about doing this, but uh, contributing the uh, the the Windows uh, side of things mean, might help us upstream the Linux and, uh, and Zen backend. Yeah, I've um, had discussions with Steve Meisner about that kind of stuff. I believe you have essentially a fork of our old drivers and you patch them at the moment for the USB stuff, uh, which I think is going to be painful for you in future. Uh, having your own child driver using these interfaces, I think, will be much cleaner. Actually, there's a worked up. Yeah, we should talk after. There's a completely new one that you haven't seen yet. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions? No. Okay. Don't uh, think we'll thank you. Um, and as I said earlier, well. Uh, you know. <laughs>